Radio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on tunein.com, hang.fm, and up Snap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to Life Mastery with Todd Allen, the talk radio show that dives into the science of higher consciousness. Join Todd and his guests weekly at 10 a.m. Pacific time and learn how to live a peaceful life with intentional mastery. Enjoy a survey of inspiring topics such as abundance, intention, health, manifestation, love, and transformation. It's all right here. Leading authors, speakers, coaches, entrepreneurs with stories and messages to support your well-being, let alone your most evocative dreams. Hey, hey, it's another groovy day. And that's because when I got up today, I really had to think about it. I really did. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on in the world. Is it going to be groovy? And I just decided it was. And whatever comes my way, I just think about that and it becomes groovy. Da, 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 da. Welcome to Life Mastery Radio, the talk show that brings you great thoughts and ideas for you to use on your very own life mastery journey before we get started i'd like to get connected and and the way that i do that is and you can follow along if you like is just consciously think about that which gives you power where do you where do you feel the grooviest <laughs> i guess that is is it next to a tree is it thinking about god the dude allah whatever it is just Consciously connect to that just for a second and think about what it is that you believe in or what it is that you connect to. Trees are kind of cool. Trees are really cool. Let's take in a deep breath. And let that breath out with just a big ah. Uh, and really focus on that connection and, and that how that works for you. Uh, let's let that come up from the solar plexus and right out of your speaker box. Uh, let's do that one more time. This time, think about those dreams, visions, and goals. And just let those roll right out with a big ah. Uh, and allow them to go out into the universe uh, and consciously think about allowing the universe, God, all of the dude, the tree, whatever it is that you connect to, to bring the opportunities to you to make those come true. Uh, head up. Get that tail out from between the legs. Smile. If you have a mask on, you still got to smile. You cannot not smile if you have a mask on. As always, my co-host is with me today, and she's got a big smile. This is kind of cool, because we don't have to worry about social distancing. You're a long ways away from me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's right. Oh, look at that. Oh, We're there's... adhering to the guidelines, for sure. How's it going, Jackie? You've been kind of busy? Yeah, it's good. Um, hanging in there, like everybody else. Christy, is she dropping in and out for you? Uh, no, uh -uh. she's good. Oh, it's on my end. Yeah, you're okay. dropping in, a in and out a little bit, Todd. Well, then I won't goof around too much longer. Jackie, take it away and let me see if I can't fix that. <laughs> What's right. going on in Jackie Bailey world? <laughs> Jackie Bailey's world. Well, you know, I have been home for the last couple of weeks, even though I go to my, st I could go to my studio. I'm the only one there. I'm not really close to anybody there it's you know my classes aren't there anymore but we're holding classes online right now and trying to keep these young people busy while they're at home keep them away from the video games as much as possible working on public speaking classes and leadership classes and trying to keep them focused on something that is going to help them be successful beyond this especially when they're not socializing right now with their friends they're losing that ability to uh, to know how to talk to people. So I'm trying to do my best to help with that situation, giving them classes and meeting together. So my wonkiness is really wonky. I'm gonna jump. Yeah. Jump over to our. I'm gonna jump over to our engineer, Mr. Engineer. I'm gonna drop out, but connect me back up here in just a second. Sound good? I think he's shaking his head. Yes. I'll be right back. <laughs> you and 
you and Chris can just kind of take on this show. <laughs> Christy, how are you doing technically? Are you I, hanging in? I'm, I'm doing great. You know, we don't need him anyway, so we can you know, just go forward. That's right. <laughs> it's late. It's ladies' night. <laughs> right? We can start happy hour and just carry on. That's right. That's right. So hold up your book, Christy, because um, I want people to know a little bit about who you are and why they need to keep listening today, because you have this fabulous book beneath the surface and you've had some pretty traumatic experiences that have led you to be able to really understand and have empathy with those who are going through grief for any reason right now. And we all are grieving something right now, right? Oh, absolutely. Seven years ago, my husband died by suicide. He ran in front of a train in Dana Point where we live. So after that, you know, I, I had a really hard time processing that. So I, I thought, okay, I have a couple of different choices here. I can either be a victim of my circumstances, or I can take this pain and figure out how I can use it to help other people. And so that's what I decided to do. So I started journaling, I started writing, and my first book was, is called What I Wish I'd Known, Finding Your Way Through the Tunnel of Grief. And in that book, I share my story and then tools to help you get through your grief journey. But my main focus, and it still is, is if we're going to stop suicide from happening, we need to start educating our youth. That's where it starts. That's where we're gonna make a difference. So that prompted me to write Beneath the Surface. A teen's guide to reaching out when you or a friend is in crisis. Mm. And so it's all about suicide education and prevention. And we've got to start with our youth. My husband was 54. He'd already bought into the stigma of mental illness and depression. So in a way, I kind of feel like for him, it was almost too late. Yeah. So let's start with these kids who are 14, 15 and teach them about mental health so that they can grow up both physically and mentally healthy. Well, that is so awesome because you, you may know this, but I, I work with youth, I work with kids. And it's interesting to me during this time of this pandemic, I keep asking them how they're feeling about this. And usually when I would ask them a question about something, they are, they're like, birds on worms, right? I mean, they are just like all over it and they want to tell me what they think and, and what they feel. And, and they sometimes they want to ramble for a very long time about subjects. I have to reel them back in. But when I ask them about how they're doing in this pandemic, they are awkwardly silent. They really don't know, I think, what to say. They don't know exactly how they feel. And I'm worried that that might be a bad sign. <laughs> what do you think? Should I well, should I try to press the question a little bit more with them? Yeah, well, you know what's so interesting about that? No, they don't know what to say because they really don't know how they're feeling because this is new. And it's also new to us as adults. How do we get them to open up and 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 share what they're going through, what what thoughts are going through their heads? We don't really know how to get them to open up because this is uncharted territory for us as well. So I guess my advice is that you can't really force the conversation. And sometimes when you just say, you know, how are you handling this? This is a difficult time for everybody. Their first response is I'm fine. You know, one right. or two words because they just want to shut off the conversation because they don't really know how to answer it. So I think uh, the best way is to observe a behavior or a pattern and say, you know, Josh, I've noticed that you're really not reaching out to your friends anymore. You're spending a lot of time in your room. You know, what are you mm. doing? And I, I'm just 
I, I'm a little concerned. And as your mother, as your aunt, or as someone who cares about you, this is a little bit unlike you. And then maybe by directing that more specifically as an observed behavior, that will maybe get them to answer the question with more than one or two words. Interesting. So you don't want to ask the yes or no type questions. You want, you want to provide them a way to answer you with some extended conversation, right? Right. And, and you're not judging them or you're not putting them on the spot like, oh, mom, yeah. you keep asking me that. It's, it's coming from a place of love and genuine concern. And I think they can feel that because you are, you are tuning into their behaviors and noticing their actions. And then you're asking based on your observations. So you're not just asking a generic question like, how are you handling this pandemic? Yeah. Right. Because that's too big of a question. That's yeah. too big of a question even for us to answer. Right. Right. right? So because is it important for them to be able to understand that a little bit of what they're feeling is grief? That they're that they're grieving for school. I mean, I know most kids say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm enjoying being off school, but I don't think they really are. I think they're missing that structure in their life and they're grieving not being able to see their friends. Perhaps they're grieving the structure that they're used to. They're grieving their, their social life, right? So yes. is that something that we need to maybe help them identify too, is that what they're feeling might be a little bit of grief and that's normal? Absolutely. They aren't sure why they're feeling the way they're feeling. They don't know why they feel empty or lost. And you know, we as adults really don't know either. So to put it in perspective, as this is grief, look at all the different losses you are experiencing right now. Loss of connection. You know, they may still be talking to their peers and texting virtually, but it's not the same as being shoulder to shoulder in school with their peers. So right. that loss of connection is big, especially when you think of teens and young adults, that's their world. That's how they base their value. And when you take that away from them, that's an enormous loss. Mm. So connection, um, loss of routine, loss of structure, loss of hope, loss of hopes and dreams. A lot of these Kids that are juniors and seniors, their proms are getting canceled. You know, their graduation isn't taking place. I have a friend who had to cancel her wedding. So mm. these are all hopes and dreams that are big losses. And when you have all this loss, you grieve. So I don't think teens and young adults are able to put that in perspective without us saying, this is normal. Yeah, we are all grieving the loss of our routine, our loss of finances, our loss of jobs. There's probably 50, 60 different losses and they're normal and OK, but you have to grieve them. You have to let out your emotions and feel what you're experiencing. So we don't try to sugarcoat it for them. Then we don't try to go, oh, you know, this is you'll get over it, it'll be better, and da, 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 da. Is that the wrong thing to say? Or is there a better way in a conversation that we can provide that hopeful outlook for them? Well, the last thing you wanna do is minimize how they're feeling. You know, the last, the worst thing you can do is say, you're gonna get over it, this is gonna pass. You know, this is just temporary, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Because then you're being dismissive mm -hmm. and the last, Thing young people need right now is to be dismissed. You need to validate that how they are feeling and what they are going through is real. And you feel a lot of that as well. So don't think that you have to fix it, but also don't dismiss it. You may need the best tool that you can give them right now is to give them your ears. Just listen, let them speak. Don't try to fix it. Yeah. Well, I think that might be a struggle that parents have as well, because, you know, normal life for us was kids were at school all day. We were at work all day. We came home in the evenings. 
we maybe said a few words to each other, probably didn't eat a meal together, maybe we did, but then kids were on to homework, on to you know, bed or social, other social things, sporting practices or whatnot. And so we probably had gotten out of the habit of talking to our children. And now the parents, <laughs> now they're having to become this sounding board, right? And perhaps the parents, and I'm talking to myself as well, maybe we've lost that ability somehow to know really how to, how to communicate with our kids because we didn't, we got out of the habit. So what do you, what do you tell parents? How is the best way to start that conversation with our child and not feel uncomfortable doing so? Well, the first thing is that you have to do what you need to do to take care of yourself and be in a sound place emotionally to have a productive conversation. Don't just have the conversation to have one, right? Okay. So the, the, the most important thing is you need to create a new routine for yourself and your family and create structure for everyone. That is the good that is coming out of this new normal is that we are reconnecting with our loved ones. We are having dinner together as a family. And these are all positives. So you also need to point out to your kids or your spouse or your, your family that I think there is a lot of good that's coming out of this. I don't think we should be so quick to just go back to the way things were, our old normal. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of lessons and gifts that we are learning right now. And I think we need to embrace them. And you need to also let your children know that these are positive things. We've lost touch. We don't talk anymore. We don't sit down as a family and have meals. So, you know, it, it, we're going from zero to a hundred, right? We went from not being around them all day to now we're homeschooling <laughs> and you, you are, you're, you're together 24 seven. So, you know, you have to, you have to kind of change the routine slowly mm -hmm. and, and, and be careful to give each other their own space at home and not put too many demands on your kids to share their emotion. You also need to realize that just because the timing feels right for you, doesn't mean that they wanna talk about it right now. So you need to find a time when you have their undivided attention, when they're going to bed, when you are sitting down at a meal, but not when they're on their phone with their friends. You know? And <laughs> if you decide that you wanna get inside their brain, and that's when you're gonna get those one word answers. Right. So you, maybe you start with a conversation by going, hello, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce myself to you. I'm your mother. <laughs> Absolutely. Take baby steps. Don't just get in their face a hundred percent because they're not used to that either. Right. Right. I would think that maybe some games, playing some board games or some card games or something together might break the ice there a little bit. Give, give your you all have maybe a little more comfortable foundation where to start talking. What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea, but make sure that you choose something that your kids are interested in. Mm -hmm. Don't make it about you. You go to them and, and ask them what they would like to do. You know, is it a card game? Is it a board game? Um, whatever. So find something that they're interested in. Right. Don't just pull out a game of Monopoly and say, hey, guys, come on, let's sit down and play this. No, mom, I hate that game. Right. So does that mean I might have to play video games with my kids? Absolutely. <laughs> Make it about them because their attention span is not long, as you know. So right. ask, get them involved in making the decision and choosing what you're going to do as a family. Well, and I think you know, along those lines, when I jokingly said you might I might have to play video games, well, in reality, it might help them if they have the opportunity to teach you something, right? If your children feel a sense of importance and can feel like I'm going to teach my mom how to do something, that might help them overcome that anxiety they're feeling, the sense of I got nothing to do and no plans to make. I mean, what do you think about that? Is that, would that be an important opportunity for them to feel valued again? 
I think that's a great idea to occasionally put your child in the driver's seat. And you're not that nagging mom 24 seven. It's like you, I want to learn from you. It gives them a sense of value and importance. And when they're feeling right now, really, really insecure about life in general, it's important for you to do things to put them in the driver's seat to help boost their self-esteem and their self-confidence. So I think that's a wonderful idea. Well, Christy, you're so knowledgeable about all this. You have so many great ideas. Maybe we need to go back a little bit to how you, how you learned this. I imagine it wasn't overnight. I imagine your journey has been uh, with a lot of unhappiness and mourning and grief on your part. So tell us a little bit more about how you worked through the process of grief yourself. And it might be that your story would be identifiable to somebody else's story. And um, tell us how you've come to the point now where you can help so many other people. What have you discovered? The most important lesson that I've learned through all of this is I feel best when I get outside myself and, and I'm helping other people. I don't want to sit at home and replay over and over again in my head, the details of my husband's suicide, right? I mean, right. initially I couldn't stop that, but I've come a long way by, you know, meditating and journaling and all these self care tools. And I'm now at the point where I've let go of a lot of things that I couldn't control. And my main priority is education and helping people. So when I go to schools, for example, if I go to a, a junior high and I talk about depression and all these different issues that our teens are facing, the self-harm, eating disorders, uh, technology addiction, depression, anxiety, parental pressure, peer pressure, self-pressure, academic pressure. When I talk about all these different issues, light bulbs are going off and thinking, yeah, that's how I'm feeling. This is too much. I feel overwhelmed. And when teens feel that overwhelm, it can lead to depression and eventually suicidal ideation. So mm -hmm. after I talk about the issues and, and what they can do and here are resources and let them know it's okay to feel that way. You know, you're not alone in this and this, our mental health is a roller coaster. And we're not always going to feel on top of our game. And after I do a presentation and a talk at a school, the main message is you need to tell somebody that you trust about what you are going through. And a lot of times that person they trust is me. Hmm. Because I'm not their parent. I'm not their teacher. I am just someone who cares. And I'm there to help them. So there'll be a huge line of kids that are opening up to me and they are cutting and they are, they are doing drugs and they're drinking and they're, they're um, addicted technology. You know, they can't come out of their room because they can't stop. So I realized through going out and doing public speaking, especially to our, our youth in the schools, they all want help. Mm -hmm. They all need an adult that they can trust. And sometimes it's not the parent. Sometimes it's not the school counselor. Sometimes it's an aunt or an uncle. But I think what I have learned is that everybody needs a safe place and a safe person. Right. And really what they need to do is talk about what's going on. And that's why it's so important as a parent that you open those lines of communication and make your child feel safe and make them feel like you have their best interest at heart and they can trust you. Yeah. Whoa, that, that's, that's great. And it makes me worry a little bit about kids now because they are at home. And if they can't tell a parent, if they don't feel like they can tell a parent, right now there's nobody they can tell. I mean, I guess they could pick up a phone and call somebody, right? But Maybe, maybe this quarantine is making it worse for those kids who are on the edge anyway. Um, I don't know. How do you, if there's a child, 
a teenager or somebody listening right now who feels like they're in a situation where they need help, but there's nobody, they can't tell a parent, they don't feel they can trust a parent or they don't have a close enough relationship with a parent. Is there a hotline or can they call you? I mean, <laughs> I mean what, what do they, what do, they do if they're in that they situation? They can go on my website at thegriefgirl.com and I've got uh, submission forms. If they just want to chat, they want somebody to be a heart with ears, I'm here. I can set up appointments, uh, which I do all day, and I can speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. But they do, you know what, I just think that's amazing that a teen would take the initiative to go online and go to a warm line or a hotline or a place like teen line where they can text and somebody will text you back and get out your emotions and your feelings. That is a big start just mm. to know that you need help and you're willing to ask for it. That's big. Ladies, can you hear me? Can you hear we me, can Jackie? I hear you, yeah. Is it sound okay? Is it wonky? No. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds so good. I'm I'm just going to kind of jump in and give Jackie a little breather. <laughs> You've been doing great, yeah, for Jackie. those of you who are just joining us, Todd has had some technology problems today. Oh my gosh. Zoom is so wonky today. And now he's going to be the unknown radio show host. That's the, no. <laughs> I know my picture didn't even come up and it did oh. before. Things are weird. Things are really weird today, but you know Christy and just listening to you you know, kids at home might be feeling what you described, but how can the parents open that door, right? I mean, what what things should the parents be looking for? Did you guys already talk about this? Am I bringing something up that you already talked about? Not really. Well, specifically what a parent should be looking for are signs of depression, right? So, you know, they're going to have some uh, mood swings. And it's, the hard part is determining what's normal teen angst and what is depression. So think of it like this. If your child starts to become someone you no longer recognize. Right. There's change in behavior. They're isolating. They're not coming out of their room. They never used to do that. They're quiet. As we discussed earlier, they're giving you one word answers or a grunt to your questions. Uh, they're not showering. They're not taking care of their hygiene. They're not interacting with their friends. So look for those changes and think of it as your child is no longer the kid that you once knew. Those during, are signs of depression. Right. During, you know, this whole dynamic has just really changed, right? We're, we're well, I, I can't say we're, but most People are holed up in their houses with their kids and they're all in the same space. Granted, they're probably getting out on micro journeys to somewhere, but this whole dynamic has kind of changed. And, and to me, you know, things are going to be different anyway. Well, absolutely. But as a parent, you have to make an effort to make that dynamic a positive, healthy one. Well, and we talked about that on our last show with Paulette Deckers too. And I, I was amazed at that result that, you know, as parents, those teenagers and those younger kids are looking to us for, for a, a guiding principle. And if we're kind of in the dumps or not taking, not really doing good self-care, that's just going to be reflected right onto them. Absolutely. That is why the adults, the parents, their self-care is going to be modeled by their children. That's let my me, point. Yeah. Let me give you an example. I yeah. have a friend who's a single mom. She has a 15 year old son who is, was struggling before the pandemic with self-confidence, with fitting in with his peers. He, you know, he would wear a, a hoodie with a hood up. He was just in a bad place. Now he is quarantined at home with his mother. It's just the two of them. What he had witnessed his mother doing as examples of self-care is she would say, Adrian, I'm really stressed. We are fighting, we're getting on each other's nerves. I'm going to go outside and go for a walk. She would come back 45 minutes later and then reset the dialogue. What her son has learned to do when he's stressed and he has anxiety, he actually says, mom, I don't feel good right now. 
I'm anxious. I, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm going for a walk. He'll leave, go for a walk in nature, come back two hours later. And the first thing he says is, oh my gosh, mom, I feel so much better. Mm -hmm. His mother was role modeling that because when she was stressed, she would get outside, go for a walk in the trees, down to the beach. And then her son learned that from her. Because you've got to remember, our teens, their brains are not fully developed. Their prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop till about the age of 25. So you need to tell them what to do. You need to be that example. Don't wait for them to figure it out on their own. And at Christy, we've had some great guests on this show who have talked to us about mindfulness. Mindfulness and getting out of our own way, right? And helping ourselves feel better. When you talk to these teenagers and youth who come to you and say, I need help or I need someone to talk to, are they open to mindfulness techniques? Do they, do they practice it already? Or do you, do you help them through meditation or anything like that that helps them to kind of center themselves? Is that something that you do or something that they could be helpful, helped by or with? You know, honestly, they're not open to it. Hmm. I think it's something that some leftover hippies from the 60s <laughs> do, really. <laughs> so I don't use the word mindfulness. Hmm. I take baby steps and let help them figure out what works for them. So in other words, I'll say, what kind of things do you like to do that calm you down? And I'll give them examples. Do you like to run? Do you like to walk? Do you like to hike? Do you like to bike, swim? And so we start there. So now we're getting them tuned into an activity that they enjoy, which will help change their brain chemistry and raise the endorphins. So I start out with getting them moving. Then I talk about what they're eating. I just start out with, let's just not, let's just get rid of the junk food and the sugar for now. Let's not worry about adding fruits and vegetables, right? Because that is their, that's their survival food, <laughs> sugar and junk food. So I don't just hit them up with, let's meditate, let's calm down, let's take some deep breaths. I start with calming their central nervous system down, raising the endorphins in their brain and start to get them to feel good so they feel better about themselves. Then I move on to, okay, let's start with some deep breathing because that will calm your central nervous system. And I know you told me that you have a lot of anxiety. They're on board with that. But unless I tell them why we're doing it and I start to change their brain chemistry gradually, they're not going to just sit down and meditate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Hmm. Interesting. Well, That's good to know. <laughs> I have to imagine, Christy, that so in it, you know, I'm always looking for the gift and whether or not I can see it or not, but what a gift it is for these kids to learn these kinds of practices and these kinds of things that they probably wouldn't get in tune with until their thirties and forties. Well, there are a lot of adults that still aren't in tune with it. <laughs> I get <Okay>? that too. <laughs> so I think when I see these 14, 15 year olds start to practice all these different areas and techniques of self-care, I think that's pretty miraculous because when I work with adults and I start right in there with let's meditate, let's call, let's take some deep breaths, let's focus and like, you know, and I take them on this meditation, they'll stick with it for a couple of weeks and then it's over. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we can teach our youth all of these great self-care approaches when they're young, think how ingrained that will be in their brains when they're an adult. Yeah. I just kind of want to take a minute. Christy has written an amazing book. Are, are some of these techniques in this particular book? This is a cue for Christy to hold up the book. <laughs> <laughs> this book is focuses mainly on issues that our teens are facing today. As we discussed earlier, uh, there's a chapter on every different issue from self-harm, gender confusion, uh, substance abuse, anxiety, peer pressure, and how to manage all of those different issues. And it's full of resources, where to go, what to do. Um, so that's mainly what this book is about. I do have a book coming out early in 2021 that oh, is I'm all, excited about that yeah that is that pairs nicely with this book 
And it's all about self-care for young adults and the science behind why they work. You have a lot of resources at your website too, and that's the griefgirl.com? The grief, yes, yes. So if you want to get in touch, if you need help, uh, all my blogs, all of my uh, stuff on CBS, everything is on my website. And you're right, that is thegriefgirl.com. So Christy, I have to imagine, I, I'm just curious. I've been watching your Facebook posts and you've been just busy, busy, busy. People seem like they're on your heels all the time. How prevalent is this in our society now that everybody's pretty much holed in and, and camped out at home? Is this, is this a huge deal or is it kind of small? What are you seeing on the front lines? You know what? I like to explain that by saying that we are all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Meaning I may be handling this quite well. You know, I might be going to work getting, this isn't true, but getting a paycheck and enjoying my time at home. Whereas you might've lost your job. You have no money. Your health, you have the coronavirus and your health and your livelihood is all at risk. So we are all affected, affected differently. So there's not a, a one cure fits all type approach. Um, so mainly what I'm getting is the people that really are struggling and they need the support and it's in all different areas. Um, and that I've never experienced this amount of people needing help as wow. I have right now. Mm -hmm. And I know too, from the statistics that I've read about that the suicide and the warm lines for help are just on overload right now. So there are so many people out there that really need support. So what can a person do? We have a lot of people that listen. They're all life coaches. And this is a curious question because there are a lot of people out there. I have to imagine that listen to this show that are more than willing to help. Christy, how would you, how would you tell somebody to, you know, start trolling Facebook or what? I mean, it's, there, there must be some avenues. Well, social media is a great avenue right now. So if you are somebody that just is, is really handling this well, and you are there to listen, you know, let people know, I promote that on social media. I don't anymore because, you know, I, I, I can only handle so much myself. Um, but use social media and use the internet right now to reach out and let people know that you are taking clients and you are here to help. So all of us need to get on board because there are people that aren't handling this as well as you are. And maybe they're embarrassed to say, you know, nothing is really that hard for me right now, but emotionally I'm struggling. So, you know what, um, what you said earlier in our uh, broadcast, Christy, is that you encourage people to get out there and help somebody else or to right. do I heard some that. sort of service for somebody else. And I think that is so important. For me, it's the only way I've ever been able to get out of a, a funk I'm in when I'm feeling bad about myself and beating myself up for different reasons. I need to turn away from me and focus on somebody else. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you mentioned that. In fact, <clears throat> on this past Sunday, I decided to have a virtual family reunion. <laughs> and so I invited my, my stepmom, my only living parent, and brothers and sister and their children and cousins and everybody I could think of to just get online together. And we for almost two hours, we just visited and each of us got to share how we're doing and what we need. And it was so fun. And yet it was so soothing and healing at the same time because we reconnected, even though we were in little squares on a, on a computer screen, we still got to hear each other in real time. And so perhaps there's something to that, That's that we, cool. that we can somehow reconnect and that we need to take the steps necessary to do that for our own survival. And I think too, and I know for me, I have reconnected with people I haven't spoken to in years. Mm. 
And I have somebody that I hadn't talked to for a year. We talk every day. So now is the time to reconnect with people and reach out to people. Because in the past, I always thought, well, I, I just don't have time right now. And I haven't spoken to them in months. So we're going to be on the phone for a couple hours, right? We do have the time now. So now is the time to reach out and reconnect with those people that you've been meaning to do forever, but you never thought that you had the time. Well, is that something right? that so now is that something else that parents can do and set up for their kids? Maybe they need to set up these play dates, <laughs> so to speak, these social dates, uh, even with teenagers and get them online and let them talk with their friends. Face yeah, face. sit down with your kids and say, what do you miss? Who do you miss? How can I help? Let's figure out a plan together and then help them and, and follow through with that. You know, not, don't just walk by and say, well, maybe you should call uh, Josh because you, you know, you said you missed him and you would like to reconnect with him. Actually make it, help them make it happen because yeah. they're so overwhelmed right now. Well, you know, that might be just a, a message to the young adults and, and young teenagers and young people for them to just think about you know, who is it that you really identify with, right? Is it an uncle or an aunt or somebody that's in their close orbit that maybe they could reach out to? And I'm sure that person would be more than happy. You know, Christy, it has to be a process of just talking and talking it out and talking it through. Well, talking and communicating with people, whether it's an aunt or an uncle that you've been taking for granted, that is reestablishing a connection, which is so important for you, for you to feel good. And it's a win-win because when you reach out to somebody, it makes you feel good because you have reached out to that uncle who didn't think they mattered. So I think that's a really important thing is to reconnect with relatives that you never probably talk to on a regular basis. And, and make a list of those people. And maybe every day you reach out to a cousin or an uncle and, and it, it, it's, it really makes you feel good when you make those connections because okay. we all need to be connected right now. That's number one. I can speak to that totally here about a couple of weeks ago, that very thing. You know, I'm a small business owner. I have employees, Christy and I was getting so overwhelmed. I have never felt so hopeless about an invisible thing that was affecting me. Usually I can fix it or I can change it. I mean, I was totally out of control and it was kind of sneaking up on me. And I talked to a friend and she was feeling the exact same way. And just this conversation that we had, I hung up the phone and it's like, wow, somebody else feels the same way I do. It's really important right now to know that we're not alone in this. And just to know that one other person is also feeling anxious or that, you know, they did one thing today and then tomorrow they're gonna do two things. Because when you allow yourself to just be isolated and don't make an effort to make connections and call people and, and, and feel like, you're in this together, what happens is that you start to slowly fall into a depression. And this sneaks up on you too. We should qualify this. This isn't anything that you recognize. It's just all of a sudden, it's like, whoa. And you need to kind of take a look at your patterns throughout the day. You know, I know for me, I get up a lot later. It's because the day is too long. And I don't have, <laughs> I don't have that eight o'clock client, right? So you stretch out the day. But when it starts to turn into, I used to get up at six, now I'm getting up at 10. I'll get up and do a few things, maybe eat, have some coffee, and then I go back to bed, mm -hmm. right? Or I'll read for a couple hours. And when you find yourself getting into this rut and these patterns of kind of self-destructive behavior, you need to get yourself in check because you're right, it sneaks up on you. And what's happening is you are slowly losing control and you are slowly slipping into a depression and you need mm. to keep that in check. Wow. And, and really? so what does a person do, right? They, they recognize it. What, what would you recommend? Is it going for a walk? Is it talking? I mean, we've talked about a lot of things. 
Well, it's going to be different for different, different people. people right. So for me, I need to have structure and routine. And I think that's true for most people. If I just say, wow, next week, Monday through Friday, I have nothing. That doesn't work. I need to get up at a certain time. Um, I'm going to write for two hours. I'm going to do this. I have to have structure and routine. And teens especially need that structure. And they're used to that in school, right? So help them set up structure. For me, I have to get outside. I have to get fresh air and sunlight, vitamin D, so that I don't get depressed. I need to exercise. I, I stay away from sugar and junk food. So, you know, there's some basic self-care tips that work for everybody. Not everybody is going to sit down or lay down and do a 15 minute meditation. And that's okay. Find what works for you. And self-care is all about doing what you need to do to make yourself feel better. Cool. Hey, you know, Christy, I have a question coming in from Cosmos. Oh, cool. <laughs> all right. So, this is someone who's watching us live on Facebook. Her name's Paulette. And actually, she was a guest of ours. Uh, oh, right. Hi, Paulette. You can't see me. Near, near, near. <laughs> she, says, she says, Christy, you talked about how to promote on social media. And I have been trying to promote hypnosis audios and health articles, but I've not seen much response. So she's wondering, how does she share more effectively with those who might need her services? And she's one too. I just want to put it in there really quick. She's one that is well studied in all of this and could mm -hmm. certainly help a lot of people. Yeah. My personal opinion is that the word hypnosis might scare people. Yeah. And so maybe back it up a little bit and, and start with something more relatable that has to do with self-care and getting yourself to the place that you want to be. Um, reducing stress and anxiety and kind of use terms and examples that are relatable. And then your hypnosis is a tool to lower their anxiety and stress because of what they're going through right now. So I would probably back it up a little bit and just hypnosis, I think, scares people. They might, you know, a lot of people think, well, I don't want to be under somebody else's control. So maybe back it up, define what you mean by hypnosis and what they are going to gain by engaging in your practice. Cool. Good, good uh, advice there. Oh yeah, totally. I totally, that's, that's very cool. That's very insightful. You know, Christy, we were doing the pre-show and you brought up something that I definitely wanted to make sure that we talk about. And that is something that you observed. And there are many tweens out there that think they're un indestructible and you know as parents we should really be diligent about explaining to them that you know that this bad behavior the behavior of showing up and hanging out with friends two feet from each other and coughing and sneezing and sharing a bottle of beer or a bottle of pop or something is not necessarily a good thing to do yeah, what I'm observing, I live in, in Dana Point, which is Southern California, and we're, we're one of the few beach communities where the beaches aren't closed. So I live close and I'm down there every day. And what I'm noticing is obviously school's out. So I get it. I would be down at the beach surfing <laughs> or hanging out too. But what I am seeing is there are groups of four or five teens walking side by side and in, on, a, on the boardwalk area there's not room for that if you're gonna if somebody else is trying to pass you right they don't move over they're coughing some of them are spitting on the sidewalk they're laughing they don't seem to have a clue of what's going on and maybe they're not going to get sick but they don't realize they could make their grandmother or their mother or family member sick. They could be carrying the virus. They, we don't know. But some of the teens and young adults that I see are not practicing social distancing and they're not being respectful of the uh, six feet, you know, uh, it's social distancing that we're asked to do. So it's really frustrating. I think the parents need to say, okay, Todd, you can go down to the beach today you know, you're 16, it's, it's 80 degrees here now with Josh 
but be respectful to the social distancing that we're all asked to do and don't hang out with 20 of your friends and be aware of your surroundings and the people around you. I think it needs to come from the parents because it's not happening outside and at the beaches. Hmm. Yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting. Kids, they probably don't see that this is a real problem, right? Especially because early on we were saying it doesn't seem that the youth have much to worry about. It doesn't seem to be affecting them as much as the, the elderly and the sick and the infirm and so forth. And, you know, in the mind of a child, hey, I'm excluded. I can do whatever I want, right? Absolutely. And I, and I, don't, all I, this. I get that. <laughs> you know, I taught school. I understand that they think that they're immune. And I understand because their brain is not really developed to make good decisions. That's why I also get it from the parents' perspective. They have been holed up all day. Please go for four hours down to the beach with your friends and get out of the house. It'll be good for everybody. But the parents need to understand that once they get out, they are a lot of what I'm seeing, they are not being respectful. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe again, the parents need to go down to the beach with them and show them, show them what does this mean? What does social distancing mean? How can you still have fun? How can you still engage in social connection without standing right next to somebody? Maybe that's just something parents need to show. Right, and when they get home, ask them how they handled it. Did you go through the parking lot with your friends and stay off the sidewalks? How did you handle it when you ran into a couple that were 80 years old? Were you respectful? Do you understand how high risk they are at, right? So you need as a parent and all of us as adults to let them know this is not just about you. We want you to get outside and get exercise and be with your peers, absolutely. But a lot of what I'm seeing is that a lot of our youth are not taking this pandemic seriously. Hmm. It's pretty spooky. Get out yeah. there, your parents. Oh my gosh, ladies, we only have about three minutes left. It looks like I know, and I missed first. Well, I didn't really miss it because I was listening. For those that of you that have tuned in, yeah, my Zoom's a little wonky today, so you're not seeing me, but you can hear me. That's kind of cool. It's good old radio back in the good old days. Christy, is there anything we're missing? Uh, we talked about a lot of things. You are such an enjoyable guest. And I, I, you know, it's just a joy to have you on the show. Is there something we're missing? Well, you know, not really. I don't think there's anything we're missing. I just really want to stress that it's so important for all of us right now to get outside ourselves and be there to serve other people. It may be at the grocery store. And, and you know, I've seen, I saw an older man, um, that was really having trouble, you know, reaching his groceries or whatever. And I said, can I, can you make a list? Where do you live? You know, I can do this for you and drop right. them off. A lot of people are doing that. So throughout the day, look for opportunities and be aware, tune in to what's going on around you and reach out to other people and offer support. We all need to reach out to each other and let each other know that we are not alone in this and no. they can go to amazon and get your book cue to hold up book that's right <laughs> i'd hold up my book it. but nobody can see it you can, also, <laughs> you can also purchase it on my website again at thegriefgirl.com <laughs> nice. where, where is it do you have a copy uh i it's behind hold it, up. hold it up that would require standing up and you would <laughs> oh. You would see my horrible. You had the book <laughs> oh, I'm at least you have pants on. Oh, that's right. <laughs> no shoes, but I have pants on. <laughs> oh my goodness, my dear! Thank you so much. You, you have such a great smile, and I know you've just been. You know that might be a way to to just close this out. Is is just quickly, Christy, how do you deal with dealing with all of this stuff? What do you do? Is there a practice that you do? You know, I, I practice all areas of self-care, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, socially, but I also set boundaries for yeah. myself. Like I can only talk to so many people per day. Right. And if, if I don't stick to that, then I start to have anxiety. 
So I, I'm very strict about my own boundaries and sticking to them so that I can maintain my own mental and physical state. Nice. Oh my goodness. I hope you enjoyed today's show. You didn't get to see me, but maybe that was a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> I just want everybody to be conscious, be conscious about your self-care. And ultimately it's really all about making it a great day and it's all about choice. So take care of yourself, take care of others and you are the light in the world. That's about it. Thanks, Christy. Bye, -bye. Thank Bye you. Christy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you next week with another.